Hi, my name is Dr. Tiffany Shen, and I am a pediatrician in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. After graduating from a small Christian college, I went directly to medical school at the University of North Carolina. While I was excited and confident that God had brought me down this path of medicine, I was unsure if I would meet other Christ followers along the way. What a surprise God had in store for me. During the first week of medical school, I was introduced to the local CMDA chapter. We had weekly women's Bible studies. We would sit on the sidewalk outside the biomolecular research building where we had lectures, eating lunch while studying the Bible and praying together. We also had monthly dinners with worship and annual lake retreats with the nearby Duke CMDA chapter, which is how God brought my husband and me together. I'm grateful to have met mentors and role models through CMDA. They have helped expand my understanding and imagination of my calling to serve Jesus as a doctor. I was so blessed by the unexpected, rich community that CMDA provided during medical school. This past summer, I've been blessed to reconnect with CMDA. My husband and I went on the CMDA fly fishing trip, and we had a blast. I also participated in CMDA's media training, which I highly recommend. Then we learned about the Faith RX series, and we started a discussion group with our colleagues. In a time when many of us are feeling exhausted and isolated, it has brought much joy and encouragement. And so we found a rich community to grow in yet again. My prayer for us and for you is that we would walk faithfully together in community as we serve the Lord. May He continue to deepen our understanding and expand our imagination for who He is and what it means to follow Him. Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you're listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I was so blessed to hear that short testimonial from Dr. Tiffany Shin, and I loved getting a chance to hear about how she has rediscovered a community of fellow Christians in healthcare through CMDA. That's one of the reasons we're here, to help Christian healthcare professionals and students connect and live out their faith in their practices, on campus, and in their communities. You heard her mention being a part of the trout fishing event that CMDA hosted this past July, and that's actually where I met Tiffany. She didn't have the time today to share with you a story that she told me back in July, and honestly, she's so humble, I doubt she would have shared it anyway. But Tiffany, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, was instrumental in putting the plight of the marginalized children in her area on the radar of the major healthcare system in which she serves. Immigrants, refugees, those without insurance, she noticed that they were not yet on the radar of the healthcare systems in her town. She stepped up to the plate and through winsome advocacy, even with interviews in the local media, got the least of these in her town the attention and care that they needed at the beginning of the pandemic. It has been such a privilege for me as the CEO of CMDA to get to know members just like Tiffany, who ardently follow the example of the great physician and look out for the least of these. If you haven't already taken the opportunity yet to find a network of CMDA members just like Tiffany in your area, I encourage you to do so in 2022. Well, that connection that Tiffany has found through CMDA in her career is only made possible through the generous giving of people just like you. Thank you to all of you who have generously responded to our year-end giving campaign goal of $670,000. While we've received many, many gifts, we still have a little ways to go to reach that stretch goal before December 31st. As a faith ministry, we depend on the generosity of many to bring the hope and healing of Christ to our world. Ministries like Global Health Outreach, Campus and Community Ministries, or the Advocacy Ministry working on your behalf at both the federal and state levels cannot have the impact they are currently having without your financial partnership. When you give, you are stepping in to inspire and to transform lives for Jesus Christ. 
please take a minute to visit cmda.org give to give your gift online or contact us at 888-230-2637 or you can email us using stewardship at cmda.org. Well, we've got quite a Christmas treat for you today on the podcast. It's a little different from our normal interviews, and we did that for a special reason. We're only a few days away from Christmas Day, so we wanted this year to take time to sit back and focus on the true reason for the season, to ground ourselves in the truth of Christ's birth. Our guest today doesn't really need much introduction because he's so well known within our CMDA family. If you aren't familiar with Dr. John Patrick, he is the president and a professor at Augustine College in Canada, and he speaks to Christian and secular groups around the world. He's been one of our most popular speakers over many years here at CMDA because he has this ability to communicate effectively on medical ethics, culture, public policy, and the integration of faith and science. He studied medicine at King's College and St. George's Hospital in London in the United Kingdom. He has held appointments in Britain, the West Indies, and in Canada. At the University of Ottawa, Dr. Patrick was associate professor in clinical nutrition in the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics for 20 years. I'm excited to welcome Dr. John Patrick back to CMDA Matters to share a special story with you. So let's listen in as he reads a little known Christmas story to us today. Hello, all my friends in CMDA who've been so kind to me over the years. It's a great pleasure to uh, make this recording this morning. But before I do, I just want to bring you up to date with all the trials and tribulations that have flowed from COVID, uh, especially with respect to Augustine College. The first thing is to say thank you to many of you who say, look, we want you to continue and we know that you won't have as many students. So charitable giving has increased, which is wonderful, but mostly the border is now open and Americans can get in. So if you know young people who are really being put off by distance learning, they should come and join our community for a year. The best part of the Augustine College program, all our students will tell you, is not the teaching, it's the community. They have for the first time in their life, a group of people who are studying the same things that they are and with whom they can talk with passion and without fear. So if you know any such, please encourage them to come. They will not regret it. That I can say after 25 years. So with that plug, uh, for which I apologize, but we need help. And I think prudently I should tell you that. I'm going to read to you now from a lovely book by Elizabeth Googe called God So Loved the World. And it's not widely known in North America. The bit I'm going to read to you now is what we normally call the Annunciation. She's done a little introduction. It's in the first chapter, but it's the second part. And it's where she introduces us to Mary, we have so little in the way of uh, help with understanding Mary, and she's used her poetic gift to try and help us understand what it might have been like to be Mary. So, the word was made flesh by Elizabeth Googe. Mary lived in a village called Nazareth in Galilee, to the north of Palestine. We can imagine ourselves travelers approaching Nazareth on the evening of a day in early spring. All around is a scene of great beauty, for the February rains are just over, and this country that for the greater part of the year is dusty and arid is now fresh and green. Behind us, as we toil up the steep rocky path, is the beautiful plain of Estrelon. To the east are the mountains of Moab, while the snow-capped peak of Mount Hermon shines out against the sky. There were many trees in Palestine in those days, the lower slopes of the hills are wooded with Caesars and oaks and ilexes, and all about us we climb up to the village are terraces of vines and olives. Though it is such a steep climb up to Nazareth, the village itself lies sheltered in a hollow surrounded by steep hills. The white houses are small, the poorer houses roofed with branches, the larger ones with small stone domes. 
Some of the bigger houses have gardens about them, planted with fruit trees, figs, citrons, almonds, and pomegranates. The almond trees are just coming into bloom, and here and there is a froth of pink blossom over a garden wall. The atmosphere is crystal clear, and the sky a deep blue flecked with golden clouds. The color on the hills is very wonderful, purple and rose, tawny orange, and the shadows sharp and dark, for this is a land of brilliant, pure color and vivid contrast, like the life we are going to try to follow. We are in Nazareth now, walking up a narrow cobble lane between the houses. The men have not yet come home from their work in the fields, and the people whom we pass are women and children. They are poor people. The women wear long dresses of blue and brown cloth that they have woven themselves on their looms, with white veils on their head to protect them from the sun. But they have woven bright garments for their children, and the little things run along beside them, looking very gay. The boys have small round caps on their heads, and or turbans bound round with a fillet in imitation of their fathers, and the little girls with veils like their mothers. Most of the women are going to the spring to fetch water so that their husbands and sons can wash themselves before they sit down to the evening meal. Some of them carry their water pots on their shoulders, others balance them on their heads. The water at Nazareth gushes out from the hillside, clear and cold. You can see that spring today, and it is called Mary's Fountain. The women linger there, exchanging village gossip with each other, sometimes lowering their voices to talk a little of the sorrows and dangers of the times. But as much as they can, they like to forget these and talk the small, happy affairs of the village that make up the brightness of their lives. They are pleased that Joseph bar Jacob, the village carpenter, is going to marry Mary, the daughter of Anne. They like Joseph. And they are talking about him as they stand by the spring, taking their turn to fill their water pots. He is a just man, they say of him. And they mean a good deal by that great word, just. They mean that Joseph is trustworthy, that when he has given his word, he does not go back on it. And when he has undertaken a job of work, he does it as well as he can right through to the end. And they mean that he is a good man whose life is clear like the mountain air and whose words and deeds are kind. Mary's lucky, they say, that he has chosen her for his wife, and Anne is lucky that she can give her daughter into such safe keeping. And then they pause in their talk because Mary herself is coming up the lane with her water pot. What does she look like? No one seems to have written down a description of her, but we are told that she belonged to a tribe that in appearance is very like the modern Bedouin Arab. That means that she is olive-skinned and slender with soft, dark eyes, girls married very early in Palestine in those days, and she is 14 or 15 years old. She wears a blue homespun dress with a white veil on her dark hair, and on top of her head is a pad with the water pot balanced on it. She has trained herself not to touch the pot with her hands as she walks, and this has taught her to hold her back straight and her head high, and to walk with the grace and dignity of a queen. Out of all the women who have ever lived upon this earth, or who will ever live, this village girl is the one whom God chose to be the mother of his son. And so we know that she was as perfect as a woman can be, lovely in mind and in spirit as well as in body, and like all lovely people, very much beloved. She must have been strong and sturdy too, like all country girls trained to hard work. And we know from what happened afterwards that she was extraordinarily brave. So the other women were glad to see her at the spring, and she was glad to see them. They talked to her about Joseph and teased her a little, and her cheeks flushed pink with happiness, and her eyes were bright with laughter as she lifted her water pot from her head and held it beneath the gushing water. She stayed and talked to them for a little while before she turned to go home, one hand now holding the full pot steady on her head, walking very slowly and carefully so as not to spill the water. Looking about her, she walked at the great beauty of the world and thanking God in her heart. The greatest moments of our lives often come upon us unawares. Perhaps she did not know as she walked home with her water pot that before the night had fallen upon this lovely land, something would have happened to her that would have changed her from a girl into a woman. 
and open for her a door into heaven that would never again be shut. The great artists of the world have loved to paint pictures of the thing that happened to Mary. They have called it the Annunciation, and they have all imagined that it happened while she was saying her prayers. Without being artists, we too can paint a picture of it in our minds. Mary's home, like others in Palestine, was built around a small inner courtyard with the chief windows and doors opening into it. The windows in the outer walls were mere slits so that the noise and glare of the world was shut out. The room where Mary prayed was cool and quiet with no sound in it except the whisper of leaves from the fig tree growing in the courtyard. The Eastern people do not kneel to pray, they stand and Mary stood with her head bent and her arms crossed on her breast and praised God and thanked him and asked him to have mercy upon his handmaid. Perhaps she used her own words, or perhaps the words of the Psalms of David that she would have known by heart. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and have mercy upon me, O God, for thy, after thy great goodness. It is not difficult to imagine the thoughts that were uppermost in her mind as she prayed. Day by day she heard talk at the spring. She knew all about the suffering of her country, and being so loving a girl, she must have carried the sorrow of it always with her. And like all of the people she was watching, day by day, for the Holy One of Israel, who would come to deliver his people. Perhaps as a little girl, she had sometimes looked out from one of the narrow outward facing windows of her home to see if she could catch a sight of him riding from the valley below with his sword at his side, or to run to the courtyard door at the sound of a strange footfall in the street to see if it were at last, perhaps now, like King David, she cried in her heart with the voice of her people, Thou art my helper, make no long tarrying, O my God. But against this dark background of the sorrow and longing of her people, the thought of her own joy would have sprung up like a flower. Joseph and the children she would have in their home where they were all lived together. She would have prayed that it might be a happy home, and then perhaps through the door that opened out in the courtyard, the light of spring sun streamed so gloriously that she looked up. And in that moment, the door was no longer just a door into a courtyard, but a door opening from earth into heaven. And now we do not have to use our imagination anymore because Mary has left a record of what happened to her then. She thought, that an angel came to her stepping from heaven into her little room. Her people have always loved and reverenced those servants and messengers of God, the angels. King David had thought of the clouds and the winds as angels and had dared to imagine them carrying God himself across the sky upon their wings. He rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Isaiah had seen the terrible six-winged seraphim who stand about the throne of God, great and awful presences who yet veil their faces with their mighty wings before the even more awful presence of God. Jacob had seen a ladder set up between earth and heaven and angels passing and repassing upon it. Abraham and other holy men had spoken with angels as a man with a man and received from them the commands and comfort and strength of God. To the four of these lovely and lovely spirits who sometimes at God's command humble themselves to stoop down beneath the low lintel of the door of earth and come to us, the people of Israel, had given names, Raphael, Gabriel, Cassiel, and Michael. Mary believed it was Gabriel who came to her that day. She had left no description of what he looked like, perhaps like the angel whom St. John saw on the Isle of Patmos, a rainbow about his head and his face was as it was the sun. The light blinded her. That is really all that people who have looked into heaven are able to tell us about it, that it is light. But she knew what he said to her. Hail thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. In this story of an almost unbelievable humbling, this angelic humility takes its place. This coming of Gabriel to Mary, this greeting of a young girl by a great angel with words of gentle courtesy. Some of the old painters have shown Gabriel kneeling before Mary like a courtier before his queen as he uttered those words. 
that have always been called by the lovely name of the Annunciation. What did Mary do? She says she was troubled, wondering what manner of salutation this should be. She must have been afraid because Gabriel's next words brought her the comfort of God to the frightened. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Then she knew quite certainly for always that God loved her and that whatever happened to her through the rest of her life, she would never have to be afraid. This certainty steadied her spirit, made it calm and peaceful like a still spool, so that she was able to accept the amazing revelation of God that followed, as the quiet water is able to receive the reflections of the sky and stars above it. She was to be the mother of the Holy One of Israel, for whom she had watched so long, the mother of the Son of God. Her watching and waiting were nearly ended now. In a few months' time, she would hold the Son of God in her arms, and he would be her son too. She, Mary of Nazareth, a 14-year-old girl whom the great world would never have heard of, she and no other was to be his mother. The angel told her this, and almost unbelievable though the revelation must have seemed to her, yet her quiet and loving spirit was able to believe it. Yet though she was no longer frightened, she was appalled by the greatness and mystery of this thing that she was being asked to do. This child, her child, was to be the son of God, the God of Israel, not of Joseph. She was asked to be the mother of God. How could she be? How could she do it? Who was she that this honor should come to her? She was not strong enough to bear it. How can this be? She cried out to Gabriel. And we can picture her no longer standing, but crouched down on the ground with her face buried in her hands. This is how humble men and women always feel when God calls them to do some great thing for him. How can I do it? How can I possibly do it? The answer is always the same. The one Gabriel gave to Mary. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Not in their own strength, Mary, do servants to God do the work to which he has called them, but in his. What a man or woman cannot do by themselves, they can do when God is with them. For with God, nothing is impossible. And so the second great certainty came to Mary. She lifted her head and opened her arms and said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. She knew a third thing now that she loved God who loved her and whose power would never fail her. She had nothing to give him but herself, and so she gave herself. She loved him so much that she wanted only one thing now, to do his will, whatever it should cost her, and it was to cost her a very great deal. She was to have great joy in her life, but great suffering too and both of them so piercing that only a woman strong and stout-hearted as Mary would have been able to endure them without breaking. I've just been told that I can give you my Christmas greetings, and with that I am happy to comply. I hope that this reading may put Christmas into a bigger context. Certainly if you can lay hands on the book, it's a lovely book to read at Christmas time. I have just read something that happened in the spring of that year, but the whole book is simply a wonderful artist giving her account of the life of Christ, a deeply Christian woman, as you can already tell. In this time of great anxiety, we should be different. And sadly, to a large extent, we have not been. We have not been in command of our own souls because we have not submitted sufficiently to the will of God. We can do nothing without him. He tells us that. Reread the parable of the vine. I am the vine, you are the branches, and my father is the vine dresser. Only if you abide in me can you flourish. Without me, you can do nothing. That's what he says. And one suggestion for Christmas, if you haven't come across and read 
John Webster's lovely collection of really homilies, a seven or eight page sermons called Confronted by Grace. It's the best book I've read in a very long time. So I wish you all a, a very happy Christmas and please keep us in your prayers and the college in your prayers. I, I long to see my successor, but there's no sign yet. The Lord be with you all. You know, I had never heard the Christmas story from Mary's perspective in quite so much detail before. And it so wonderfully paints a picture for us to envision what it must have been like for Mary as she prepared to follow God's will for her life through the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We all know how busy the Christmas season can be, and we can become easily distracted by all the decorations and the gifts and the wrapping and all those traditions. But I pray that this brief introduction to this book by Elizabeth Gouge helps you refocus your thoughts on Christ's arrival and set your heart on the true meaning of Christmas. Despite all the busyness you may be facing at work or at school, at church or in other areas of your life. It's no wonder that Dr. Patrick is such a well-known speaker, especially within our membership here at CMDA. If you're looking to connect with him, you can just visit johnpatrick.ca. One word, johnpatrick.ca, and that's short for Canada. You can also learn more about his work with Augustine College at augustinecollege.org. That's one word, Augustine College. In addition, you can find more of his recordings in the CMDA bookstore at cmda.org slash bookstore. And one more thing, Dr. Patrick and a few of his colleagues now write a regular bioethics column in the quarterly CMDA Today magazine. Be sure to check that out at cmda.org slash CMDA Today. Well, I join Dr. Patrick in wishing you a very Merry Christmas with your family and let you know that next week I'm going to be joined by George Courtney, who serves as CMDA's Vice President of Stewardship and Legacy Giving. We're going to be taking a look back at 2021 and all of the ways that God has blessed CMDA throughout this last year. I can't wait to share some of the amazing stories that we have lined up for you. And be on the lookout for this episode because it's going to drop just a little early so that you have time to listen before the end of this calendar year. As always, I want to thank you for listening today to CMDA Matters. In closing, I pray that the peace of our Savior's birth fills your hearts with joy this Advent season. As Dr. Patrick shared with us, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Not in their own strength do servants to God do the work to which he has called them, but in his. What a man or woman cannot do by themselves, they can do when God is with them. For with God, nothing is impossible. I hope that you will remember those words as you celebrate Christ's birth this weekend with your loved ones. Or as you spend Christmas Day treating patients in the hospital. No matter where life finds you this Christmas season, nothing is impossible. And it's only through Him that we can do the work He's called us to do to bring the hope and healing of Christ to our world, CMDA. That's what matters to CMDA, and CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.